In the second part of this lecture, I want to give you a brief overview of the four positions on free will that we want you to take. Each one I'm going to give you a slide of description, a slide of arguments for, and a slide of arguments against. The first position is libertarianism, and this is perhaps the simplest one. So libertarianism might say that many or even most things in the universe are causally determined, you know, physics rules the universe, but our decisions are not determined. We are completely free as agents to be the start of a causal chain of events. We're completely free to make decisions or actions with a start of, of other causes. So we are ourselves an uncaused cause. And this sort of the beginning of a causal change is called um, contra-causal free will. And if you want to pin this opinion on anyone, then Descartes would be a good one to start with. So he, as we may remember, believed that the mind and the body were completely separate, but they interacted via the, uh, the pineal gland in the brain. So for Descartes, the mind was a free agent. It could, it could cause events in the body. And so for Descartes, the soul of a mind was the start of a causal chain of events. And that's the libertarian view, that the causal mind is sort of separate from, from the rest of the causal interactions of the universe. And there are two sort of flavours of argument about uh, libertarianism. One you can think of slightly less physical, uh, physically grounded, so slightly less dependent on the laws of physics, for example. And these might be called an agent-causal theory. So this is where the agent so the mind or the human or the soul or whatever it is, is the beginning of this causal chain of events. And that's Descartes' position. So we or God acting through us can cause things to happen in the physical world. And Descartes might have said that the non-physical mind can cause physical events to happen. And for an agent to cause an event in a truly free way, it might be it might be that it's completely independent of our past character or experiences or completely independent of, of the environment around us. And that view is a little bit problematic, as we'll see in the next slide. So in contrast to the sort of non-physical agent causal theories of, of free will, we can think about a slightly more physically grounded event causal theories of free will. And these rely on the fact that the physical world is not completely determinate or at least it's very, very complex, or it could be that it's a little bit random in some cases. So a relatively small amount of randomness in the universe or in the brain or in the body allows a certain amount of free will to be possible. So this randomness could cre be created themselves by the agent, or it could just arise in the brain, in the neurons perhaps, or the, or the synapses, or in various networks of the brain, and perhaps this is sort of a pre-conscious or unconscious uh, sort of random state of affairs in the brain. And various physical theories can be used to sort of support this view. For example, quantum physics is an area of physics in which the normal rules of of, uh, of physical interactions don't seem to apply. Instead of instead of being completely determinate, quantum physics is more about a sort of a probability that something will happen or a or an indeterminate. So there's a probability that, uh, you know, the apple will fall from the tree, um, but it's not perfectly sure. Another physical theory that might be used in this arena is uh, chaos theory. And that's the idea that, that very small differences in physical systems at the start of a, of a process might end up producing very, very different resulting effects. So the classic example in chaos theory is that a, a butterfly flapping its wings in, in Japan uh, might start a hurricane in Bermuda on the other side of the world. And this is the idea that very, very small, almost random changes in, in the physical system might end up um, producing quite radically different effects, depending on exactly what the initial starting position was. And the image in the centre of the screen, these two sort of uh, ellipses come from chaos theory sort of approach and it's the idea that things things might be in two relatively stable states so here's in this case think of it as a planet or orbiting around a, a star or something and these lines are the the orbits that the planet is taking 
And for most of the time, the planet will just go round and round on one on one set of orbits, for example, the left half of this image, and it will seem quite stable. But then, depending on, ex on the precise conditions, it could easily flip between orbiting the part on the left and orbiting the part on the right. So a relatively small change in the situation can lead to a rather dramatic difference in the overall structure of the physical system. So these complex and sort of almost unpredictable properties of physical systems have been used as a metaphor to say that, you know, maybe the brain has some of this as well. Maybe, maybe some of our free will is in fact just sort of the emergence of these very complex chaotic properties. That's why I've put at the bottom of this slide that this position seems to be a little bit similar to emergent materialism, that, um, that complex psychological phenomena might sort of emerge as completely new new levels of explanation in, a, in, an otherwise, in an otherwise physical brain. So these are the kind of arguments that are put forward for libertarianism, how it might be possible that we have genuinely free will. But of course you can argue against these two positions. So to argue against the non-physical agent causal theories, that's the ones which say that the human agent can just be the start of a, of a chain of events completely freely. You can use the argument that um, that it's like we have no character or no personality or there's nothing intrinsic to ourselves. So if, if all of our past history and all of the things that have affected us have, have, no, have no effect on our future decisions, then it's like I don't have a character. I'm not the same person that I was a minute ago because I'm now making completely new freely chosen decisions that are unaffected by anything that's happened in the past. And so for, for self-identity to have any real meaning our past history of events and experiences must determine partly at least our actions and our, and our freely chosen decisions. So a second argument against libertarian theory is the ones that use more physical or event causal uh, approaches to free will. Um, you could say, well, not all physicists believe that quantum phenomena really do Im imply an indeterminism. Instead, it might be that sort of these random or quantum events actually occur at a very low level in the brain, for example, molecular level or synapses or neurons. And, and maybe those individual quantum or random events are not enough to produce a sort of whole level, whole brain decisions or, or whole brain phenomena at the level of the person that we're actually interested in. Yeah, they might change one or two neurons firing maybe or one or two synapses, but they're not, not enough to, to affect meaningful real world decisions. Another way to argue against it is just to say, well, even though these these physical systems may be complex or chaotic, or you get these emergent phenomena coming out of physical systems, they're still purely determined systems. They're just currently more difficult to explain. Even quantum phenomena, they might seem to be indeterminate, but actually maybe we just haven't understood them enough yet, and maybe they're just more difficult to explain. And one of the people who've, who've criticised this view of the libertarianisms is uh, John Smart, an English philosopher. Um, and he used the garden slug to, uh, to make his point. Indeterminism does not confer freedom on us. I would feel my freedom was impaired if I thought a quantum mechanic trigger in my brain might cause me to leap into the garden and eat a slug. And there's a picture of a slug there in case that's uh, not evidence enough. So SMART then is talking about quantum changes in the brain uh, and how they're not going to be enough to, ha to really have a, a meaningful effect on, on, what, on what we feel to be our free decisions are. It's not going to change us into a frog, you know, in, a, in an instant. We're not going to suddenly go and start eating slugs in the garden just because of some minor random change in my brain. So that's libertarianism. What about the opposite end of the scale? And this is not to say we have free will, but in fact to say that everything is completely determined in the universe. And here's a picture of uh, a puppeteer attached with his strings on, on the brain, suggesting that some sort of demon is controlling all of our thoughts and feelings and desires and emotions in our brain. So a hard determinist would say, well, we know that the physical laws explain causality in the universe in general, and we know we can't change the past. So it must be the case that we have no free will, right? And Laplace 
uh, a French scientist from several hundred years ago, was the first to sort of start thinking about this. And he proposed that there might be a demon, or God, you could think, um, who knows the state of all the atoms in the universe at this very moment. The demon or God knows where every single atom in the universe is and where it's going and what it's doing and where it's come from. And so if this demon was really omnipotent and om omniscient, then the demon must know what's about to happen next. And if that's true, that the demon knows exactly what's going to happen next, then it can't be true that, that we have a genuine free will. So a hard determinist will say, even though it feels like we're making choices, these are just part of an eternal physical causal chain in the universe. And, and we just, you know, we, we just have to go along with it, even though it feels like we're not. And the hard determinist can simply just point to you know, the physical sciences and neuroscience to say, well, here's the evidence. Physics has done very well in explaining the motions of the planets and how uh, different matter interacts with other matter and energy and light and electricity. And the neuroscience is sort of doing the same as like the physics of the brain and the mind. So the, arg the arguments on, on the side of hard determinism are sort of most of modern Western science. So why might you disagree with this? And there's a cartoon up there on the left, which is which you can read in your own time. So against a hard determinist, you might sort of raise a sort of fatalistic argument to say, well, if if actually all of our thinking and our deliberations and our decisions and our emoting and our, our procrastinating and ruminating over everything we do, if, if none of this has any real effect on us, or our actions, then why why do we bother to do it? Why do we spend so much time thinking about what to do and what to say? And you could say that I might as well worry about what I might have for dinner yesterday. It's, it makes just as much sense to talk about the past as it does the future in this in this sort of de completely determined world. And this would be a sort of fatalistic view, and it seems pretty depressing actually that the universe is completely determined, so there's nothing we can do about it. Um, we just have to sort of put up with it and get on with our lives. <laughs> a determinist might respond that our thinking does have an effect on our actions. Um, and it is important to go through those thinking and deliberation processes. But, you know, that thinking was also determined to occur. Hmm. I mean, that doesn't seem like a very strong response to me. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you think very different. So a really hard determinism and a fatalism kind of seem to go hand in hand to me. But but how do other people try and argue against this hard determinism? Is there a compromise position somewhere between libertarianism and and hard determinism or fatalism? Yes, is the answer. Yes, there is. There are. Uh, something in between hard free will and hard determinism is what's being called compatibilism. Now, William James, the psychologist, 100 years ago, said that these this was really like a soft determinism. So it, it's sort of picking the bits of determinism that it likes and, and rejecting the bits that it doesn't like. And whereas it's, it's more generally known as compatibilism. And that's the idea that free will is compatible with the universe being physically determined. So a compatibilist will say that free actions are made and done voluntarily and they're caused by internal states internal to ourselves our bodies and our minds and brains internal states like desires and intentions and by contrast they'll say that determined actions are those which are forced upon us or coerced for example at gunpoint or because you've been arrested and you have to you have to do particular things in particular times and particular orders so the compatibilist aims to change the definition slightly change the argument it's not just about free will versus determinism. It's about free actions versus determined actions. And it really just puts the puts the emphasis on that um, a free action is one that's done according to your own motivations, whereas a determined action is sort of forced upon you. And the image I've put here is of a man with a gun, seems to be holding up, uh, sort of mugging someone else with without a gun uh, and presumably asking for money. And so when forced at gunpoint to, to do something, a compatibilist would say that your actions are no longer free in this situation and you're being forced by someone else into what to do. 
Whereas a hard libertarianist would say at this point, well, you still have free will to choose what to do in this situation. You could run away, you could fight back, you could give your money, who knows? So the compatibilist really wants to talk about a different kind of distinction. Freedom versus coercion, rather than freedom versus hard determinism. And this view seems to be quite popular with uh, psychologists and neuroscientists and the philosophers of mind who we talked about before, the materialists. So Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, argues that free will should not be seen as some sort of omnipotent power to remove yourself from the causal world. So we are still very much a part of causation and causality. We can't just decide to be outside of you know, the causal chains in the universe. Instead, they want to shift the argument onto questions of autonomy. And this is free will is about the ability to choose actions based on your motivations, to act free from coercion, to be autonomous. And Patricia Churchland, who we met from her eliminist, eliminativist materialist <laughs> uh, position on the mind-body problem, she talks about how free will is most important to stop doing particular things, to stop some of our actions and using our self-control to prevent ourselves doing what we might otherwise have done. And you can amusingly call this the, the free won't argument. So it's like free won't, I won't do this, I won't do that. So Churchland then talks about self-control and there's a couple of videos that I've suggested uh, on YouTube that are, are good. It's uh, Patricia Churchland talking through her position on self-control and the brain. So a third American philosopher, Harry Frankfurt, also agrees with this position and he makes the uh, examples of sort of drug addicts and, <clears throat> and how you can have a, a second order or higher order volition. A user who wants to stop wanting drugs is, is having a sort of a second order volition. At one level they want to take some drugs because it will make them feel better perhaps, or take away the pain. But they might also have a second order volition that they, they also want to stop wanting drugs. So it's like a meta volition or a higher order volition. And Frankfurt focuses on these kinds of examples and say that when, when someone is using their higher order volitions, that they, they are able to act freely when, when they choose to, to go against one of their lower order volitions. So when a, when a drug user wants to stop wanting drugs and then actually acts acts against the interests of his own desires and wants, then that's when you can say that someone has truly free will. And people taking a compatibilist viewpoint would say that these sorts of meta-volitions, higher order thoughts and higher order cognitions are what separates us from animals. And this view is also consistent with folk psychology. The idea that sort of, you know, a, I wanted to do this, but my body made me do that, or I wanted to do this, but, but I found myself doing something else. There's a feeling that we, we do operate in a sort of a sphere where, where we, we could have some control over some of our more animalistic desires and uh, behaviours. And a compatibilist would argue that free actions are those actions in society that it's reasonable to hold people to account for. So they should take responsibility for them and they should take the blame if something goes wrong. And we have a whole system of, of law and a whole system of society which holds people to account for their actions. And those things that we blame people for or give people responsibility for, those are the actions that we think are free. So the compatibilist seems to be a compromise position. They accept that the universe is almost entirely determined but they also accept there seems to be free will in the way we behave, the way we act, the folk psychology, and the way we think about our own thoughts. But there is an essential tension at the heart of this, and they know that this form of determinism, this compromise, may not be ideal, but it's just that they find the alternatives to be even worse. So the randomness of some forms of libertarian indeterminism is worse than the sort of compromise, the messy compromise of compatibilism. So to, to argue against this messy compromise of compatibilism um, is quite simple. You can just say, well, they're not really talking about free will versus determinism anymore. They've just changed the argument. 
it used to be something absolute. So either you have free will or you don't have free will. That was a nice, a nice clear absolute argument. And now they've changed it to something more relative or contextual. So they'll say <clears throat> you you have free will to stop an action or to to decide to do something else or to de decide to do something against your better nature or against your worse nature. So they've sort of made it slightly more relative or contextual. But fundamentally, compatibilists are determinists. So it seems that they're just playing with words when they talk about being free is just to have been able to do otherwise at the, situa at the time in a particular situation. But the fact is they didn't do otherwise. You know, every single action we make is it's it's a single action. We didn't do the other thing that we could have done. So why why did we do this one and not the other one? And so there's no real there's no real conclusion to this argument. They've just they've just changed the definition of the argument. And Van Inwagen, another uh, American philosopher, just puts it in this sort of simple logical terms. The problems with compatibilism. So we all agree that no one has power to change the past and we, we also can't change the laws of nature. Number two, we don't have the power to change how the past influences the future. So therefore, no one can possibly have the power to change the future. The final position on free will that I want to mention is an impossibilism. And I've also seen this referred to as illusionism. And I think they're two probably slightly different things, but I'm going to talk about them together at the end because they're they're sort of not really agreeing with the whole framing of the argument. They're saying that the argument about free will versus determinism is is mistaken. It's it's not even a, a sensible thing to talk about. So on the one hand, either our actions are determined and lawful and they follow, follow the laws of physics, or they're not determined and they're random and they don't follow the laws of physics. So it seems unnecessary to add in free will into this equation. Either they're completely determined or they're completely random. Adding free will doesn't seem to give us anything more. And so an impossibilist view or an illusionist view might be that um, instead we shouldn't be talking about determinism versus free will. We should actually be talking about determinism versus randomness. Is the universe determined or random? Is our brain and our behaviour, is it determined or is it random? And that might get us closer to the, the questions and the answers we want to make. I'm not quite sure where this particular neuroscientific example might fit in, but I want to give it because it's a common example that comes up in philosophy of mind. It's come up before in the course, uh, and I wanted to stick it in here again just to remind you of this, this set of ideas. So about 50 years ago now, um, Benjamin Libet uh, set up these experiments where they could record the electrical signal over the, over the head, so it's EEG, um, and they asked their subjects to just make a finger movement at some point over the next few seconds. And when you do this, if you if you look back at the activity over the brain which was occurring before the subject moved their finger, you'll see this sort of increasing electrical potential. That's the blue line in this figure. So it's increasing in electrical voltage over the motor areas of the brain. And then when the finger begins to move, there's a sudden change in the in the electrical potential. And that's how you know we command movements. Now the trick in this experiment was that at the same time as waiting to make a movement, subjects were also looking at this red spot going round on a clock. And the subjects were told to say where the red dot was when they made the intention to move. So they had to try and make a movement and they had to also be looking at the clock and notice where the spot was when they decided to move. And the finding was that subjects said that they were aware of making a movement about 200 milliseconds before the finger begins to move. And this sort of makes sense that um, it takes some time for the signals to get down from the brain to the finger. So that's probably about 50 milliseconds. And then it Perhaps it also takes time to make the decision. So the coming to a decision might take 100 milliseconds or so. So 200, 200 milliseconds seems to be quite sensible. The unexpected part, though, is that you can see from the graph that the blue line starts increasing a long time before the 200 milliseconds. So a long time before the subject has, is aware of making this movement or of intending to make this movement. 
So the implication here is that the brain has somehow already decided to move, and only several hundred milliseconds later are we aware of deciding to move. So this suggests that our decisions and our awareness of those decisions actually comes after, quite a long time after, the brain processes which cause those decisions. So the Libet studies are an, an example of how you can argue that actually mind and, and free will are sort of epiphenomena. Um, they're not really involved in the actual processes, the brain processes, which, which give rise to movements. So an impossibilist or an illusionist might argue that because the universe is deterministic, free will must be impossible, um, and that any any feelings that we have of free will are actually an illusion, and that the brain is, is tricking us into believing that we actually have this free will. And I put a, a link to Daniel Wegner there, who he's written a book called The Illusion of Free Will, and um, it's definitely an idea which has attracted a lot of neuroscience attention. Now, I don't really have arguments against impossibilism or illusionism for you today. Um, so I'd like to throw in one more problem. Now, it came up earlier that uh, quantum mechanics and quantum physics uh, suggests that various parts of the universe and various physical processes may not be even determinate. So hard determinism may not be true even for the physical world or for the, uh, the, the mental world. So if even physics is being used to question whether the universe is determinate, it raises even more problems for whether the mind is determinate or has free will. So I'm just going to leave you with that thought that even physics may not have solved the determinism problem. So to summarise, to find out where you sit on the free will determinism debate, you just need to ask and then answer several questions. The first one is, is the universe deterministic? If you think the universe is deterministic, then you need to decide, well, is, is free will still compatible with this deterministic universe? And that will lead you down another alley of philosoph philosophical choices about exactly what kind of compatibilism do you end up with. But if you don't believe that the universe is deterministic, then you have to decide, what well, is our free will at the level of agent? So is it some sort of soul or mind or unique agent that is causing events to happen? Or is free will derived from a certain randomness or quantum effects or chaotic events at the level of events, brain events and neuron events? Or alternatively, you could just reject all of those questions and just say this whole debate is an illusion, it's a mistake, we just shouldn't even be talking about it. The real question is what happens in a deterministic world and what happens in a random world. And like with most philosophical questions of interest, and even most psychological and neuroscientific questions of interest, there are no answers. But perhaps the best, most optimistic thing we can say is that just like the mind-body problem, maybe we should just wait for new kinds of physics to help us work out what free will is. Thanks to all the thinkers and do ask questions, uh, and I, I apologise if I don't know the answers, but I'll try, I'll try, I, I promise. <laughs>